So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to TST meeting. Uh, today, the, the principal item on the agenda is to provide an update about the Micronos project. And uh, um, we had a work week in Italy last, uh, last week. Andrea hosted us, and we made a lot of progress. So we thought this was a good opportunity to share the progress um, um, about the project and uh, give you possibly also some live demos. So just just a little recap um, on the on the project itself. We have a working um, we have a kind of working document which summarizes the rationale and kind of the motivations uh, for the project, as well as some of the high level kind of technical tenets or edicts uh, that we decided to frame the project around. Uh, the, the there will be three major subsystems of this, at least at the base, at the core. One is the topology. One is control for programming flow, uh, programming uh, forwarding plane and shaping it using P4, and then the last one is configuration, which will rely heavily on GNMI, GNOI to uh, manage the and configure the environment. The kind of fair agreement discussions uh, that were set up several months ago, we decided that we would focus first on the functionality where Onos is lacking the most, which is the Onos configuration. And so this was the subject of the work week is to kind of establish the ONOS configuration project and set up a very similar kind of a base pattern from which the other projects would run as well. Now, um, we originally intended to just work on ONOS config initially and then when it's done kind of shift over to the control and the other uh, and topology. But um, I think some new developments uh, will allow us to very shortly after having started the ONOS config is to also start the, uh, the, con the other subsystem as well. So basically we should be able to move across the full breadth of functionality to make, uh, I'm hoping, a fairly rapid pro progress on, uh, on the micro ONOS uh, project. Um, the, as, as we discussed in the past meetings, we main for this project we maintain the ONOS branding. Uh, the, the new architecture we're referring to it as micro ONOS architecture, which is because it's based on microservices, GRPC, and it's oriented to, towards the new generation SDN protocols such as P4 runtime, GNMI, GNOI, GRIBI, and will make heavy use of the standard YANG models such as uh, OpenConfig. So that's just a brief overview of uh, the project and where we are. And uh, I think I can, at this point in time, hand it over to Andrea, who's going to provide some more specifics on how we decide, how we're going to be hosting the project and how we're going to be working on it. Andrea? Uh, you're muted in, the, in case you're speaking. There we go. Yes, uh, I was uh, about to share my screen. So you guys could see what uh, they need to talk about. So, uh, hello everybody. I uh, just wanted to give a brief overview of uh, what we have in terms of um, existing project uh, structure. So we created. Uh, the share was lost in the case. Yeah, your share went away. Okay. There we go. Okay. okay. Let me keep the agenda over here. Okay, so um, I was saying that uh, we have this uh, new project, which is called All Project. This is new. This is a new organization which will host all the repositories of that multi repo uh, approach that Thomas was mentioning. Uh, at the moment, it's just one uh, repo, which is almost config, uh, which hosts the code that uh, um, we're going to show and we started working on. Uh, for the configuration subsystem. Um, this follows what is uh, a long the GitHub organization. I see Onos Project as the organization. That's yeah. what it it's the Onos Project as the organization, exactly. We departed from hosting this under Open Networking Lab because the idea was just to keep this uh, as the, the whole micro Onos. Uh, set of uh, repos, ONOS config, ONOS topology, ONOS uh, uh, control, uh, maybe ONOS docs, uh, and then ONOS deployment in the future uh, will be hosted here. And this will become one 
organization with multiple repos hosting different sections of the controller. Okay. Uh, very much like Core does. Yeah, we, we claimed the Onos project name. It was uh, squatted upon by somebody who didn't have any repos or any um, any commits, and so GitHub basically freed the. Uh, yeah, freed the for some, yeah I saw that email. For some reason, I, I was thinking Onos project was something else, or where the main Onos was, but never mind. Just yeah, the main Onos project is under the ONF Open Networking Lab uh, account, and we'll keep clearly keep yeah. it there. But okay. we wanted to establish something along the structure which follows the pattern of Kubernetes and other other projects which have uh, other multi-repo projects which have their own namespace. Yep, makes perfect sense. Yes, and um, uh, the code is written in Go, so it follows the Go structure in the, the code base uh, of different uh, uh, folders. We this is kind of we we went around and looked at uh, what. We, uh, what was there in, uh, in, in place for other Go projects and uh, we found the structure which we liked and we adapted it a little bit uh, including just the folders that we, uh, we needed. Um, the PKG so folder file. is usually, the PKG folders in Go is usually binaries, right? No, it's, uh, that's where no, the software that is library folder. Time. Exactly. So that is the main folder where all of the libraries, all of the main code, the, the main group of code and classes and Go files are in here. Like here, you can see we have already folders from many of the code that we wrote. If you take a look, for example, at the northbound, it has JMI northbound diagnostics, and uh, Sean will talk more about this later, but whole point the package folder is the main bulk of the code while the command folder is the one hosting the commands uh that run the project and run different elements and things yeah i guess i'm i because again uh, uh, a go workspace the pkg is where it puts binary live compiled binaries so this um, seems the vendor folder. Also, so uh, no, the no 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 vendors were sources so as we discussed, we follow a specific pattern. Uh, there was actually of a project that's checked into GitHub, um, as, and as was documented also on uh, on the Micronos word, the, the Google Doc. Um, okay. This again. This uh, is uh, which project was this modeled after? Yeah, can you, Andrea? And David, I think I think there might be confusion over two things. I mean, there is under Go, there is a PKG folder where things are deployed to, but usually under source and the name of the, the, yes. the namespace of the project, there is usually also a PKG folder to hold the uh, sources for that uh, project. Okay, I, I see Kubernetes has done that. I was looking at other projects that haven't done I mean, most of Go projects I'm familiar with, like Docker, I don't think does that, for example. Um, I do see that in the Kubernetes pattern. All right, I'm just, it just hit me a little different. Yeah. Uh, David, this, uh, which are, um, I'm sharing, is that uh, base project layout which we used and referenced. Okay. If you can take a look, and it's, it's a lot of documentation. But point being, uh, some of the meta things as well as like the project issues and pull requests and stuff like that, Andre? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we went away from the, the Jira um, and the Garrett uh, workflows to introduce a full GitHub-based workflow. So tracking is done with uh, with issues. Uh, you just can open an issue, assign it uh, to different people. It's very similar to Jira in itself, uh, but is all done inside uh, GitHub. Which is nicer to be in one and only one location. Uh, we also started a set of uh, projects that kind of mimic the, the key structure of the code, where the southbound really relies about really talks about the code in the southbound, and the northbound is really focused on the code in the northbound. If we pick one of those, uh, we have a series of uh, it's a Kanban board with a series of. Uh, um, um, columns, uh, which uh, is a to-do column, which all the things that are related to the northbound are, 
uh, when you open an issue, you can assign it to a project. If you assign it to Northbound, it will show up here on the left. Uh, then there's the in progress. Review in progress is when you assign a reviewer to the to the review uh, to the pull request, and that pull request gets reviewed. If it gets approved, it moves to review uh, review approved, and when it's done, it, it moves to to done. Uh, to a pair uh, pull requests with issues, um, we documented this, but you basically have to write the fixes pound and the number, and that moves the issue over the different columns with your pull request. Um, uh, we also started what uh, um, GitHub has as milestones. Uh, we have a first demo, Milestones, which uh, is a demo we're working on. Uh, we didn't want to set any time frame uh, or any fixed conference. Uh, ideally, this is uh, going to be due by uh, May 31st. Um, just to, to do some of the initial work and um, have an internal demo of uh, what we are doing. So for the first initial work, we added um, tasks to this milestone and we will go about and create more milestones where, when the project uh, proceeds uh, with the releases and demos and uh, um, milestones over a certain period of, uh, certain period of time. Uh, the other very important thing that I want to touch upon is that we also keep the docs inside the, the repo itself, so the version with the uh, code. And uh, we have a very good set of documentation, uh, at least for now, for the, for, the, for the time being, it's pretty good. And uh, the readme file gives a few overviews of the objectives and the high-level design uh, figure. And then there is different uh, documentation on how to contribute, how to build, how to run uh, the developer workflow summary and the context of meetings. If I take, uh, for example, look at uh, how to build, this describes exactly how to build on something locally, the Docker image, execute tests and documentation. Uh, and every doc document is, pres is present here in the docs folder. Um, so I encourage everybody to take a look at, uh, at the documentation. And um, one thing that I want to just uh, touch upon is uh, the context and calendars uh, file that Thomas will talk about later. Uh, so this is kind of an overview of uh, the projects on, Git, the project on GitHub, the issues, the pull requests, the different projects within the Honest Config repo and um, how we go about creating issues and creating pull requests. So I would like to give it over to Jordan for the Docker Docker Hub uh, overview. All right. Yeah, so um, we're using uh, uh, Docker to, to both for, well, for a couple of purposes. We use uh, Docker images to both build the project and uh, to actually produce a final uh, product. So the Docker files can be found in this build folder inside the repository. So as I said, there are a couple of uh, Docker files. So the reason that we have a, so dev Docker uh, this is basically a Docker image that we use for building the project. And the reason is there are a bunch of dependencies uh, <clears throat> that we don't necessarily want to install locally. So things like uh, Protoc. Uh, currently, uh, I mean, current, current Onos, the one that's hosted in the Open Networking Lab repository. <clears throat> um, if you have uh, things like Protoc installed, you can't build uh, current Onos. And so we created an, uh, just a Docker file uh, that has all the dependencies that you need to build Onos config. And so we use this during the uh, build process. And we also use it in CI, which Ray will talk about. <clears throat> and then in addition to that, there's a much smaller Docker file that's suitable for Kubernetes, which I'll talk about in a little while, that just uh, uses Alpine as the base image and only produces the Go uh, binary and adds it to, to the Docker file. So the way that we're distributing uh, 
the Docker images is on Docker Hub. We created, a, again, an Onos project repository. Um, all right, yeah, so in the Onos project uh, repository, well, I guess we've had this for a while because Onos is in there. <laughs> but yeah, you'll again find the Onos config build uh, image. So this is used, for example, by our CI uh, pulls from this repository so that it can build the project and run tests and things like that. Uh, and then we are distributing the actual binary under the Onos config manager project. I don't have too much more to talk about than that. I'll get into it a little more with the Kubernetes stuff. I just want to add something, Jordan. Um, I wanted, I've been trying to set up the automated builds on Docker Hub so that we don't have to push things out. Um, I really want to get that to work this week. So that way what it'll do is it'll notice anytime there's a change to the repo and rebuild the Docker images for us. So we won't have to do it and push things up. That sounds good. So now Ray is going to talk about uh, CI, right? Yeah. Ray, Ray, you might want to check with Zach on some of the stuff. We were doing some of the original push-up or having build on Docker Cloud or Docker Hub uh, with some of the other projects. And uh, there were some reported issues. I'm not quite sure what they are. I mean, I did some of the original builds on the cloud. Um, yeah, and... I, I, I do want to – I should talk to him. That's a good idea because he uh, – the problem that I'm having, I think, is because it logs in as me, which means it sees my trees, which is really not what we want. So, okay. So, you change uh, presenter or you? Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, you, uh, I can change presenter. <coughs> also, just a, you know, some since the project is just starting, some things are still moving about. So, for example, we'll probably be renaming the Onos Config Manager to be just Onos Config. Um, just for uh, brevity and clarity, uh, so there will probably be some naming name changes as uh, as the project you know settles down. Go away. Right, you should be yep. good to go. Should be good now. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about CI. So um, for the original Arnos, we used Jenkins and we used Garrett, and we decided on this project to try as much as we can to sort of stick with the GitHub base environment. Um, there's a publicly available free CI infrastructure called Travis that for simple things integrates extremely well with GitHub. So that's what we set up last week just so we have some basic um, basic checks on the code that goes in. Um, so you'll see when we have a pull request, um, we'll click on this one down here, you'll see this little red X here. That means, or it even gives you a pop-up, it tells you it failed. So this is one I checked in this morning to show what Travis looks like. So when you do a check-in, there's these three boxes down here that all have to be checked green. One is that a re at least one reviewer has approved it. The one in the middle is the equivalent of the plus one from the Jenkins user in the current Onos world. And then this one is that this merging is blocked is the accumulation of all the ones above it. So you can see this continuation, sorry, continuous integration, Travis CI failed. So there's a little detail button over here at the right, which you can click, which will vector you off into um, Travis. And so we can actually see what happened. And see this in red down here is the error that was generated by the CI job, which is telling me that I stuck in this bogus variable here called why am I here, that I used a single equal instead of a colon equal, which is a compilation error, and this was caught by the CI infrastructure. So what CI will do is it'll build the code, it'll run the unit tests, it runs a check that um, licensing headers are on um, the proper source code files, and it also runs two static analysis tools specific to Go called GoVet, and um, I forget what the other one is called. Which was GoLint. Golink, yes. So these are sort of uh, static analysis kind of tools to make sure that the Go language standards are being adhered to. Not not comp not syntactically, but uh, uh, code uh, source code. 
but also about a, a go format dash l not the go space format but the one word go format dash l which will can give you a list of files that are not compliant with the uh, go lang format style good idea that's a good idea we talked about that a little bit um i didn't hook it up but that that is that's a good idea as well because you know my, my feeling with standards is if they're if someone else has gone through the pain of you know dealing with the VI versus Emacs kind of problems, um, why would you not use them? I mean, yep. Every, everybody hates Golang format and everybody loves Golang format. It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, like Thomas likes to say, when in Rome, you know, when in Go, do as, as Google does. I thought you guys were in Milano, um, but that's okay. Well, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go back to the pull request and just show a, a quick, so here's one that I checked in this morning that isn't broken, but you can see that my my check mark was given by the CI job, which means that if someone reviewed it, it could be checked in. Uh, yeah, if you want to, go ahead. Thomas is going to review it now. My screen should light up. So the other one of the nice things about GitHub is it's it knows it senses when people have made changes behind your back and updates your UI. Oh, somebody reviewed it. Andrea, they That's what I did. <laughs> Beat me to it. So now somebody can merge it. We can watch the merge go live. How exciting is this? Um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about about CI. Um, the other thing Thomas had me down for was running stuff, which is not very exciting. What I'm going to show, uh, you'll see much more of this when Sean actually gives the demo. But I wanted to look to just show. Um, Andrea check, uh, touched on this a bit. Uh, we do have docs in here. So, for example, if you want to know how to build and run, you just have a build file, right? This, I'm really liking this notion of putting the, um, the docs right in the source code. Um, it's really in your face when you make a change. You have to remember to update the docs. You don't have to log into some stupid wiki to do it. It's right there in front of you. Uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a much better paradigm than the way we were doing it before. So there's basically two ways you can do the build and run, uh, which Jordan touched on a bit. You can do this where I'm looking here, this Docker run, blah, blah, blah. What that's doing is that's basically talking about the layer that um, we have to do builds. It will download that and run via Docker the entire Go thing inside that container. What's nice about that is you don't have to have any Go infrastructure loaded on your machine at all. The only thing you need is Docker. Everything else is contained in the, in the uh, image that you run. Uh, for now, we're using Make because Make is sort of ubiquitous. It looks the same on Mac and Linux. And I mean, look at our Make file. It's like six lines long. Um, I think that at some point we'll probably have to move to something like Bazel when our life gets more complicated. But for now, the Make file is, is perfectly sufficient. Uh, and that can be run either as part of this Docker. When you do this Docker run, blah, 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 what it's actually doing is running make inside the container. Or if you have things locally, you can run it here directly from Go, or you can run it from make. It's up to you as a developer what you want to do. Um, I guess that's about it. Yep. Anybody have any questions? David? <laughs> All right. No, no questions. Question. Okay. We'll turn it over to, oh, oh, one more thing I wanted to mention about uh, Travis. Um, Travis is really nice because it integrates really well into GitHub. It's all just clicks in the UI. There's one little YAML file you have to write that's 15 lines long. I'm not convinced that for the kinds of things we're doing with Onos that Travis will cut it for us. So there's two problems I see with Travis. One is that if for the free account, it only allows a single job to run at a time. Uh, our Jenkins uh, for the, the existing Onos consistently has, you know, between five and ten jobs running. So I think that would, that would put a real burden on the sort of development cycle if we could only run one of those jobs at a time. The other thing is we use our Jenkins uh, for things like integration testing and building Docker images and doing test installations and that kind of stuff. I didn't see any way to do that in uh, Travis. So it may well be the case that we do have a bunch of Jenkins jobs that are either timed or triggered to do these more complicated things and we continue to use Travis for the, the basic verification jobs. That'll depend on how many of these situations we get into where we need to run multiple verifies um, in parallel. 
Well, and we have, we have other options too. We can, well, first of all, one thing to keep in mind is that these projects, since they're going to be, they're going to be limited in size. They're not going to grow nearly to the size. So the build times are going to be much shorter. Yeah, which means the queue times are going to, the queues are going to drain much faster. Yep. So this may be less of an issue. Yep. But even if it becomes an issue, we can still probably spring up for the uh, right. pro version yep. if needed. Yep. Uh, but I think, so building and verification, I would probably argue that we ought to stick with Travis one way or another, whether free or the paid. But then exactly the system test and the integration test where it requires more spinning up or potentially different kind of different triggers yeah. will probably be done in Jenkins. Yeah. The other thing with those kind of jobs that Thomas was just talking about is those require access to infrastructure either in here or at Flex or at AWS, and these are not things that I want Travis to have access to. Exactly. So uh, that kind of stuff I think will continue to be hosted in Jenkins. So I'll uh, pass the control over to okay. Sean. Uh, Sean, I'm not sure you're on the web client. Hopefully that can present. Yeah, I, no, I, yeah. Should, I should be able to. I should be able to, Thomas. Yeah, let me just. Uh, sorry, I thought I was able to. Your entire screen is grayed out for me, but uh, okay. Let, let me just. Uh, let me. Just get the um, the slides going first. So I wanted to yeah, to talk about this. Uh, I'll just put it in, put it into mode. This was your slide, Tom, which was uh, established previously, and that's the overall uh, context. But uh, I wanted to introduce the next one, which was basically a dive into like how the uh, config will work. Um, so. Uh, so I wanted to start on the uh, on the inside, uh, so to speak. Uh, so this is is the internal storage structure, and, and as I go then I'll build it out to the northbound and the southbound and so on like this. And at the core of it, there are uh, three stores, right? So there's the the change store, is probably the the core of it of it all. This is basically a set of um, change values. It's uh, just a, a, a list, a set effectively uh, of path value and removed or not removed uh, tuples, okay? And, uh, and, and basically when changes are made, um, they are immutable. Uh, so basically they're, they're stashed away in this, in this data store and uh, they're not changeable. They're there as a set and uh, an ID is generated from that set of paths um, uh, that, you know, using a SHA, a SHA algorithm. And that then is the identifier of that change. Now, the idea behind that is, you know, the change, you could have one change representing the complete configuration of your device, which would include many paths. And, you know, the, the concept of having a path and a value, every leaf on a tree of configuration is addressable uniquely by its path, no matter whether it's a list or a choice or any kind of the config structures that, that can be represented in Yang, um, you know, can be dealt with through this kind of uh, path value and whether you're adding or removing this particular path in this particular change. Uh, in the case where you're removing, there will be no value. And for the moment, we're keeping values just as string values, but we may change that to make it a value type and maybe represent the value as a, as a, as a byte array. Okay, so... Is this essentially a blockchain of change? I guess it's not, it's not like a linked list. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what, how the term blockchain applies to it, but just regard it as, as a, an immutable block of, of change values. Okay, and well, I'll give it a If I have a change, I'm changing from a state, right? A change mm -hmm. is always from one state to another. Mm -hmm. so why won't you describe it and hit me as kind of a blockchain? I was wondering if that's because essentially you have the hash of the previous state, and then you have a change, and you generate a new hash based on that change. So what's what's happening here is um, here I'm representing a, a set of uh, values. There may be no previous value for that. In fact, this is agnostic as to whether there was a previous value or not. It's only at the point of extraction that you start overlaying 
one change on top of the next change on top of the next change. And it's at that point that you uh, that you fully realize what the full configuration of the device should be now. Okay. Okay. So these changes are regardless of device. So basically they just represent a path within a sub device. Okay. So it could be, you know, system or it could be interface or it could be interface interfaces slash interface one slash whatever you want it to be whatever leaf you're referring to or, or uh, instance of uh, of an interface okay so uh, then in the configuration store um there's really a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, configurations and devices uh, in the current implementation but it would be possible in future to have a set of configurations per device that maybe there could be a running and there could be a standby or there could be um, something like this if we wanted as well. Um, and basically the configuration store holds a set of change IDs for a device and these are an ordered uh, set and really it's only holding the ID here. Uh, so basically what it is is when it comes time to extract the configuration, you can iterate through the change IDs find the change for them and overlay the paths of the base one with the paths of the next one and the next one and the next one and so on, building up uh, an overlaid tree of configuration changes. Um, and, and so in this way, uh, you know, all of the change is not being held inside the configuration store. It's just that hash the ID. And uh, the other advantage of this is the configuration or sorry, the change store is immutable. And the benefit of that is that, um, you know, once, if you're on a distributed system, once you uh, create a change, you can distribute it to, uh, to your other nodes and you know it's not going to change. And, and really it's only the, the configuration store is the, the dynamic piece here. Um, now, at this stage, uh, there's, there's no point uh, looking at individual changes to see if they, break or don't break uh, the model restrictions of a Yang model because changes can't be taken in isolation. Uh, validation can only be done against a complete tree when you're dealing with Yang because you may have things like, you know, there might be a restriction in the Yang that says I can only have eight interfaces on this device. And, you know, some it's only at the point at which you add everything up and consolidate all of the configuration that you can actually validate. Another example of this might be um, the choice keyword in, in Yang. You know, you might have a choice that might give you an option to put in maybe uh, a container or it might be a leaf. And, and it's not, uh, so, so therefore you can't have the container and the leaf at the same time in your store. And really, it's not. It's only at the point that you consolidate the, the configuration and view it as a as a layered set of trees that you can actually validate against it. And so, in the current implementation, we haven't dealt with uh, Yang models at all at this stage. But that's something that's going to come pretty soon. And then finally, the network store uh, is um, an ordered set of configuration. So configuration to change mappings, okay? And basically what it does is it allows you to define a network change that's going to span many devices. So you can make, a, in, in one single action through GNMI and Artbound, you can, um, you can request a change to many different devices, and this will enable, enable a system-wide rollback, a rollback of all the devices that, that had that change. And so maybe all devices would not be involved in a change. Um, and there might be, you know, different groups of devices uh, grouped together and, and there'll be a set of rules around that about what can be uh, rolled back and what can't. Okay, so uh, this slide is animated and I was just going to show the next kind of layers up. So what there is is uh, uh, a proxy here that represents the topology. So it tracks the connectivity of devices. And so, you know, in future, we'll get it from the owner's topology block. But for the moment, it's implemented as a store, okay? And it's something that's kept in memory. Um, and, uh, and as that topo cache uh, wakes up and realizes devices are there, um, 
these uh, synchronizer instances uh, for these devices get instantiated. And uh, in the next slide, uh, I basically uh, color in the, uh, the north bound and uh, this item here, the listener. Okay, so here we have the southbound down to the devices and here we have the northbound where you deal with all devices. So you can do set, get and subscribe and uh, hopefully we're going to be able to show those things in, in the demo. So uh, item uh, one here is, uh, so a configuration change is made and I go down and make that change uh, to the change store. Um, then I update the configuration store because now I'm saying the config of this device has this new change in it. And then I update the network store saying, here are all the devices or all the configs effectively that, that are included in this mega change, this epic, I suppose, if you will. Uh, and uh, and, and the, as, as those things get created, the configuration store emits an event to the listener and then um, each of the devices uh, listen out for their own related events and they pass them down through the synchronizer to the, um, to the actual device itself. And the listener also has a function that the northbound interface is also listening to us so that if you had another user connected to your northbound interface and they were subscribing, they would hear the changes that another user had made. Okay. So, so maybe I missed something for my clarification. So when you do a set, it goes to the change store. And yes. then is it an event from the change store that updates the configuration store? Or does no. that set have to actually make a call to the change store to say, here's my change. And then to the configuration store that says, here's my change. So yeah, all three of those are coordinated by the uh, the manager, uh, the, sorry, the service that's servicing the GNMI. So, a session gets established and, uh, and and a service is instantiated here that takes actions one, two, and three. Is there any reason we're not going kind of, a, you know, having the thing say, here's my change, put it in the change store and having that essentially be an event back to the configuration store or the network store, depending on the change, I suppose, and, and having the changes propagate that way as opposed to having a coordinator? Um, so one of the reasons, for example, is that uh, say, for instance, you were uh, setting the same change on two devices. Um, uh, basically, the, the, what the controller does is it realizes, you know, it sends a change down to the change store and it realizes actually, you know, when it's sending down the second one, I already have this change. And so it doesn't create the change the second time in here, but it does have the list of devices. Um, so I think that the reason that uh, we're using a controller is it's keeping track of what are the changes, what are the devices, and basically just adding it together and, and putting it in the network store. It's it's a pretty lightweight operation, and uh, and and really uh, I didn't really see the need to uh, to um, you know put you know a lot of functionality into the change store. Or the configuration store to do to do this kind of chained effect. It's it's something that we can achieve um, here. I mean, uh, set really is is the main input function in um, in in this whole thing. You know, I mean, uh, guess is just a passive uh, request. Yeah. Plus, also the controller has to be in charge of uh, propagating any failures uh, upwards. So it's 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 effectively a synchronous operation for set. I'm not totally convinced, but okay. Well, we've tried to follow the basically the, the set semantics uh, as they're as they're documented by um, Google in the GNMI. So we're trying to follow that. Now, clearly, that still leaves some room for uh, different implementations underneath. Obviously, um, so that's what we have uh, so far. Yep. Okay. Okay. That's uh, that. That's more or less it for this slide. Uh, what I was going to do then is is uh, give a demo. No, uh, I don't know how effective that's going to be uh, with uh, with my screen sharing, but I, I'm going to give it a try. So so basically, um, in the demo, uh, uh, what I was going to do is basically do a, a GNMI change uh, for 
one path within one device. So basically this was just going to be setting the time zone on, on the device. Uh, and then I was going to do a get to show the value of it. Um, then I was going to subscribe for changes uh, on, on a path uh, in preparation for the next stage. Uh, so this is a GNMI subscribe. Then I was going to do a change that has uh, two paths uh, for two targets, okay? And uh, then I was going to do the get of the, I was going to set the time zone on each one and I was going to read back uh, device one and two separately. And then I was going to show the admin interface uh, that we have in addition to GNMI and the diagnostics interface that we have in addition to the GNMI functions. So really what we're, we're, have, we're doing here is we're coming at this from a, a situation where we're going to have the device simulators uh, are up and running. There's uh, three um, device simulators in there. Um, the config manager, I'm going to start it and uh, I'm going to be passing in the location of certificates and stores and so on. Um, I'll have two more terminal windows and uh, I'll have the GNMI CLI command. Okay, so this is something that comes as part of, uh, of the GNMI project. Um, okay, so uh, let me exit this and I'm going to stop sharing this one and I'm going to share my terminal window. Uh, so, uh, sorry, give me a second. Um, uh, let's see. So, okay, can you see that terminal window? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. It would be good if you could make it a little bigger. I don't know if you can. Here, we'll make it bigger on our side here. Um, okay, so so really, I was just showing this. Uh, I think they meant the font because when you yeah. changed it, the font went back smaller. Better. Yep. Okay. So uh, so so basically, this is just to show that uh, that the Docker container or the the simulators are up. And uh, here then I was just going to, uh, okay, so I, I have, a, I have um, uh, yeah. So I've got three windows and I'm gonna have to juggle between them. Uh, let, let's just see. You've lost, um, your, um, you've lost the terminal for now. But yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's fine, Thomas. I'm going, I'm going to show you another one. Um, Okay, all right, give, give me a second here. Uh, so I have some notes in, in Keep and I'm going to just uh, copy them and, and uh, paste them in to the window so that you can see it, okay. Um, it's a little bit awkward, but so we'll, we'll get there. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me just copy this, you probably Okay, so this is the run command. So this is uh, Onus config, and basically I'm giving it the location of uh, uh, the four stores. So basically the config, the changes, um, the network store, and then the topo cache one is, is this one. And, uh, and I'm giving it some certificates as well, right? Because it's serving uh, GNMI and it's got, uh, it's got to serve that GNMI northbound. So basically uh, it's connecting to the uh, devices and uh, for each one of the devices I connected to, uh, I'm getting, I'm testing the capabilities and uh, and just printing them out. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop sharing this screen and I'm going to go back to the other screen. Bear with me. Um, uh, okay. Okay, so hopefully you can see this one. So this is the one I, I was going to... Um, uh, this, yeah, this, this is the one I was going to do the set on, right? So let, let me just uh, copy the set here. And, uh, and what I'm doing is uh, I'm setting a system, clock, config, time zone. Okay, and I'm giving it the value Europe Dublin. 
okay? So I got my op, uh, update, which is a response telling me that, that the value has been set, okay? So I'm going to do uh, a guess of it now. Um, and uh, uh, I'm reading back the value. I've got your Dublin, that's fine, right? Uh, the next thing I was going to do is uh, subscribe uh, for changes on a path. And uh, what I'm going to do is try and run this in the background uh, because uh, otherwise I'm going to use up my terminal windows. Um, so that's in the background now and that's there as a subscribe, right? So the next thing I was going to do is make another uh, change here. And here I am. What I did here was I, uh, I picked on two devices, right? So, so basically I have two devices and I have two changes on each device. So the first device is 161 and the first path on it is time zone name and the value I set to Berlin. The second path is also on 161 and it's got the message of the day banner and it's, uh, this is demo device one. And then the third change is on device number two and I'm setting the time zone value to be Europe Paris. And then the fourth change is uh, the message of the day banner. And it's going to be, this is a demo on device two. So, so basically I get the response back. Each one of those was uh, an update. And here is the response from the uh, subscribe request. Okay, so basically it's, it's returning this uh, subscribe value in this, in this uh, tree format. Uh, is, is how it's doing it at the moment. Okay, so uh, so that was it, uh, holding on to values. Um, and I was just going to do the, uh, the guess one more time. So this is on 161, and this is getting the, uh, the time zone name. So you can see it's Europe, Europe, Berlin. And I was going to do it on the other device here, which is 162. And it's Europe, Paris, okay. So then um, in the, in the uh, on the northbound, we also have a number of functions called admin functions and uh, diagnostic functions, okay. So, so one of these, uh, the admin function is uh, basically to be able to read back the network changes. And so basically this was, this is a tool that uh, Thomas developed and uh, it attaches to the config manager through gRPC. Uh, it's outside, of, it's like alongside GNMI and it's something that allows you to see the network changes. And uh, you know, what it's doing here is it's basically showing you that uh, I made two network changes. Okay, so the first one was given this hash and uh, the second one, uh, consisted of, and it only applied to device number one and the second one applied to uh, two devices and each one of them got their own hash. And the reason each one of them got their own hash is because the content was different. The time zone was different between the two of them. If the time zone had been the same and the message of the day was the same, it would have copped this and basically it would be the same change ID on, on both, okay? So the, the final uh, thing I want to show is, um, the uh, diagnostics interface. And again, this is a gRPC to read the, from the changes database. Um, well, actually what I have first is I have the config, uh, I added a new one. So this is reading from the config store. And basically uh, there was, um, they're not in any particular order. There were two other devices in my store um, and that's fine. I've added on a new device. So it's created uh, one configuration for device 162 and one configuration for device 161. And here is the only change that was made on 162. And there were two changes made on 161 the two changes that, that I showed you. And finally, finally, there is, uh, there's another command to show the changes. 
Okay, so here uh, I've got, um, you know, each of the changes, again, there are no particular order, uh, but basically you can see here, here is the case where there were two paths changed uh, in the one go. Um, neither of them was removing a path, they were both adding, so, so removed as false. Um, you know, the, the value is in there as a string. Um, the changes. This, this, for instance, is a, is a full configuration for a switch uh, in in you know in the example world. And so the changes here really aren't uh, specific to device. It's only through the configuration store that they're actually linked to the uh, to the device. So um, that's uh, that's really it. That's uh, that's that's what I had to demo. And um, hopefully, can people you can have the description, Sean? Say again. Can you show the output of the subscription you run in the background? Uh, yeah. So the the output of the subscription was uh, was yeah after this long one. It, it's this one here, Andrea. Perfect. Yeah, I, I backgrounded the subscription, so when it came in, the uh, the value got uh, got thrown into the foreground here. So, uh, any any questions on this or, or on the slides that went uh, prior to it? So let me just really quickly add. So the, that's clearly the you know this is just uh, initial um, examples of the administrative and diagnostic tools inventory. We expect that to grow significantly. For example. An example of changes that we expect to be done through the administrative interface are ability to be able to roll back changes even after they've been committed to the environment without you know explicitly specifying the reverse operation by just simply identifying the change that you would like to roll back you should be able to uh, roll it back and the, um, the system will automatically compute the inverse set of configurations that need to be applied to the environment so there will be many uh, many more are, uh, operations like that. You know, we expect also ability to register uh, Yang models uh, that the system will support through that administrative interface and things of the sort. Thanks, Sean. That's really excellent. And, and in addition, Thomas, I mean that admin and, and the um, the diagnostics interface will also be useful if we want to build a configuration GUI. You know, GNMI functions only give you so much, uh, you know, to really get to the heart of, like you say, rollback and and understanding the flow. It's it's important to have the, those extra interfaces. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the the admin interface here are full on gRPC interfaces. Clearly, will come will supply sort of commands to allow access to them from command line. But uh, yeah, there, I think they're. Uh, the, the purpose of the interfaces is to also serve as a programmatic backdrop. Yep. All right. Uh, who is next on the agenda? Andrea? Uh, well, it should be Jordan with uh, the Kubernetes deployment. We skipped that. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we did. That's okay. I wanted to go after Sean, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, he's, he's, uh, here is. You can see that, right, Jordan? Yep. Uh, yeah, so I've stopped sharing, Jordan. You should be able to share. Um, all right. <clears throat> all right, so yeah, I'm going to talk uh, about Kubernetes. So basically, what I wanted to do uh, last week was try to get basically the same thing that Sean showed uh, running on Kubernetes. Uh, and that's why I wanted him to show first. So, uh, so everything I'm going to talk about, so I mean, as Andrea mentioned there, there's this docs folder. So inside the docs folder, there's this deployment uh, documentation. So this basically documents uh, everything I'm going to talk about. Basically, it documents uh, Setup of a local local Kubernetes cluster. There's no description of uh, production, but it's pretty pretty similar. Uh, and then all the commands that you need to be able to deploy all the same things that you just saw from Sean, and be able to uh, use, for example, the GNMI CLI to to access the cluster. 
So also, as mentioned, we're following the package structure that we showed. So all the Kubernetes related stuff is found in the deployments uh, folder. Curr currently, there's only a Helm folder. So <clears throat> Onos config is the Helm chart for actually deploying the config manager. So what a Helm chart provides is basically uh, you just define a set of templates and uh, you can pass arguments into the templates and uh, basically Kubernetes manifests are generated from the templates and sent to Kubernetes. So the Onos config Helm chart consists of a bunch of different components. The main component is this deployment. So a deployment in Kubernetes is basically a set of pods. A pod is a set of containers that runs an application that share that share a network interface. Um, so this this uh, this deployment basically defines a pod that uses our well. This is just a template variable, but <clears throat> pulls from our Docker Hub account by default uh, and runs the Onos config manager, uh, sets up secrets and things like that. Uh, also mounts mounts a configuration and whatnot. The configuration for the application is stored in what's called a config map. <clears throat> so the con I mean, a config map is just a, a blob of data that you can mount to a pod that the pod can read from. So this configuration, you can actually modify when you're <clears throat> deploying the Helm chart, you can modify the configuration uh, and that will get mounted to the, to the Onus config manager and it will read the, the changed configuration. There's also secrets. This is how the TLS uh, certificates are set up. So inside the uh, Onos config chart, there's this files folder. So files is where the uh, certificates and the configurations are stored. And these are actually loaded into, these are the default, basically the default values that are loaded into the Helm chart when you, de you deploy it, which I'll show. Um, then there's a service definition. So a service in Kubernetes is basically it's what exposes a pod, or in this case, a deployment to other uh, to other pods running inside the Kubernetes cluster. So this basically says uh, the Onos config manager is reachable on uh, port 5150. And then finally, there's something from, called from a from a HA point of view, we're looking just to have a a, a service of VIP that will. Uh, map to various one or more instances of config manager, for example, or how yeah. are we dealing with HA and that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So keep that simple. Um, yeah. And then, so one, one uh, detail about Kubernetes also is that things, uh, pods running inside of a Kubernetes cluster are not really accessible outside of the cluster by default. So what you have to set up is something called an ingress. So an ingress is basically just a set of rules for an external load balancer. And so this chart also provides ingress support, which I'll show a demonstration of. And then in addition to the Onos config home chart, I wanted to try to set up the same kind of end-to-end -end test that Sean showed. So there's also a device simulator chart. So <clears throat> the device simulator chart basically sets up the same simulator that Sean was just playing with uh, inside Kubernetes. And the actual, uh, the image for the simulator can be found in this uh, tools slash test slash device sim uh, folder. So basically that just takes this image and then uh, deploys it in Kubernetes. <coughs> can you guys see this? Oh, there we go. Right. So I already have a, So I already have a Kubernetes cluster set up that's pretty much empty. The documentation that I showed shows all the commands that I'm going to do right now. So I encourage other people to test it out and make sure that it's correct. <clears throat> so I mean, all you have to do to uh, set up an Onos config pod is just run Helm install. So when you run Helm install, it shows all the resources that were created. So it created a secret for TLS, the configuration, the service, the deployment, and 
one pod that was running inside the deployment. So currently the default value for, it's, I mean, a deployment allows you to set the number of pods, but currently the default is one since we don't actually have a distributed store behind us. Uh, and then once, once it's running, you can view the pods that are running. There's just one pod called IC Jellyfish. <laughs> uh, and you can see the logs. So this currently is trying to connect to basically the default devices that are set up in the configuration. So it doesn't really do anything right now. What I have to do to get it to do something is, well, a couple things. So I'm gonna get rid of this Helm chart. I have to type this out because Helm has a bug in it. Yeah, so in order to deploy, I mean, in order to do a real end-to-end -end test here, I have to deploy first a device simulator. So the device simulator chart, uh, you can deploy it just by giving it a name and pointing to device simulator charts. So the device simulator chart just basically only just creates a pod, configures it, and exposes it to other components, which the service is the mechanism through which the OS config manager will reach the simulator. So I'm gonna deploy a couple of them actually. So not ready yet. Yeah, so the device simulator basically uh, is listening at a service called device one and device simulator at port 10161. <clears throat> so in order to connect the Onos config uh, manager to the device simulators, all you have to do, let me try to find this command. Copy this. So there's an argument in, well, there are a couple of things. So first I want the uh, Onus Config Manager to be uh, accessible externally, so I enable ingress. So a prerequisite to ingress is that you have to have an ingress controller running inside your Kubernetes cluster. That a description of how to do that is in the documentation that I wrote. Uh, and then all I'm doing is passing it a list of devices to connect to. So these are the names of the services through which the Onus Config Manager can reach the simulated devices. Yeah, and then deploy it. And so that should have created one Onus config pod. And when you look at the Onus config pods logs, you can see that it actually connected to the device simulators, uh, got their capabilities and everything. So now, and then the other component of this is the ingress. So it's not set up yet. So the ingress. So this is basically setting up rules that, I mean, I'm using an Nginx ingress controller, that Nginx will eventually populate these rules in an external load balancer. And when it does, you'll see an address show up here, which it did. So now basically the ingress is available. So I should be able to make the same kinds of requests to this Kubernetes cluster that Sean was making at this demo. <clears throat> Let me try that. Let's see. Let me find it. All right, so this is a this is the actually one of the same set commands that <clears throat> that we were looking at before. So uh, yeah, so basically it's setting the system clock uh, time zone name to Europe slash Dublin uh, using the uh, certificate, the key and certificate that is expected by the load balancer, and this should be able. And uh, I mean the notable part is the target. So the target. Uh, device one device simulator is what will be used by the Onus config manager to actually map this request to the correct device. So run it. And so it says it updated. And I should be able to uh, read back the configuration. Boom. Very cool. 
that's all I have for that demo. I would strongly encourage people to try to go through the docs to make sure they're correct, but we'll uh, continue to build on this and uh, use it for development. This is awesome, Jordan. Yeah, very good, Jordan. Cool. Cool. Any questions? One thing I, I encourage people as they develop this stuff, always develop it under Kubernetes if you're planning to deploy into Kubernetes. Um, I've just seen elsewhere where, and, and Helm as well, right? When, when the development path starts to diverge from that yeah. deployment, it, it's been, been a pain in other projects. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, we've already seen seen that uh, just even during first week, right? That uh, you know, it helps to structure the code, uh, um, knowing how it's going to get deployed. And so it was really great to have Jordan uh, figure all of this stuff out, especially with the with the service load balancing, the ingress, and everything else. Anyway, thank, thanks a lot, Jordan. Uh, I think, uh, Andrea, do you, Andrea, do you want to just cover the last uh, two things that way we don't have to switch over? Uh, sure, I'll keep it short. Yeah. <laughs> so just uh, just a follow up and uh, to finish it up, um, I want uh, would encourage everybody to jump on board. Uh, we have uh, what we call developer workflow, which uh, you guys are seeing now that uh, goes to how to create a workspace and linking to a contributing um, file that we have that shows uh, how to do basically uh, forking of the repo, uh, cloning the fork, uh, creating a, a local branch, and then uploading that branch to your repo, and then creating a pull request. Uh, to create a pull request, uh, we uh, have a few um, let's say suggestions to make and uh, requirements for uh, you to contribute to uh, uh, Onos config. Uh, if there is an issue, find it. If not, open one. And while you while you work on while you're working on an issue, please move it into the in progress state, and then create the pull request, uh, touching up, uh, pulling in fixes number of your issue. In that way, we're tracking it properly. In uh, inside um, the almost config GitHub uh, workflow, um, and again, uh, go through the documentation. If you find something that you don't like, just feel free to reach out, reach out to us, or or fix it yourself. Open up, open a pull request, and we'll be glad to uh, review it. Uh, the last thing I want to uh, mention before I let everybody go is that uh, we have a um, community information file. And for now, uh, we're going to keep the work uh, and the questions related to Onos config and the new the micro Onos effort under the Onos developer uh, mailing list. But we would just like to ask everybody to prefix their subject with uh, uh, break um, square bracket Onos config square bracket, so we can kind of at a glance recognize that that is related to the Onos config project. Uh, we also have a Slack channel uh, that is MicroOnos. Uh, feel free to join. That's a public channel where you can just post questions and ask uh, and ask things and comment on whatever work we're doing. Uh, calendar, same as the Onos project. We do have a daily stand-up at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Feel free to join any day, except the ones we have the technical steering team. Because as you see Wednesday, the technical steering team is again at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, and it's going to happen every two uh, weeks, uh, give or take. Uh, and uh, we're going to use the same as lot as the previous on CST, and in an ad hoc fashion, we're going to move it, move it, uh, move the topic from Onos Config, which we plan to give regular updates on, to uh, proposals and discussion need to happen on the existing. Uh, on us uh, code base. Um, so again, uh, feel free to take a look at the repo, the docs, uh, uh, try the demos for yourself, try deploying it on Kubernetes, and uh, just uh, jump on board. Uh, the work is going to continue, uh, and, uh, and you can follow it by following the issues that are in progress and that uh, we are working on. 
That's great. Thanks, Andrea. I think that kind of covers the the, the agenda. At least as we planned it uh, uh, up front. We ran a little bit long, but hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, most likely, um, the default item on the agenda will be the TST um, for the TST meetings will be the updates on the Micronos project because we expect it to move along rapidly. But of course, uh, at any given point in time, if, if people have other topics to talk about, we can certainly dislodge that or schedule, um, um, you know, off week uh, TST meeting. And that's all I had. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. A great job, team. Um, we'll uh, see you in two weeks. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.